Chapter 9 um, is the agency contract um, section of uh, the book. So we said agency. What is that? That's our relationship with who? The firm. Principal. It's a firm's relationship with a principal. It also could be a broker's relationship with their firm, right? So when we talk about agency contracts, what kinds of contracts, what kinds of agreements do you think we're talking about? Not a sales contract. A listing agreement would be an agency contract. A buyer agency agreement, right, would be a, an agency contract. An employment contract between us and our firm would be an agency contract. Property management agreement. Any agreement where a client hires a firm to perform a real estate task for them is an agency contract, right? Why would the sales contract not be considered an agency contract? It's not a relationship. And the two parties it's between are buyer seller, right? There's no agency relationship there. Does that make sense? The other thing I'm going to point out about this before we get into the slides, before we get into the chapter, the contract that we have with our clients is going to dictate something that's very important to us. It's the most important to you in a transaction. Getting paid. Getting paid. It's not, it ought to be, right? And so, Anything that deals with you getting paid should be where? In writing. In writing, in writing but where? In the contract. Which contract? The listing agreement or buyer agreement. These contracts. <clears throat> when we start talking about contracts between a buyer and a seller, is that a place to talk about what you get paid? No. No. There might be a test question in there somewhere, folks. Can you put stuff, statements, verbiage about commissions in a real estate sales contract? No. No, because agreements to pay commissions are between who? The firms and clients. But the sales contract is not between firms and clients, is it? Who's it between? Buyers and sellers. So can you put statements about commissions or fees in a sales contract? No. no, you might want to remember that. So, um, on, on that contract, it never states uh, a commission for a broker. A sales contract will never state a commission for a real estate broker for a real estate firm. Matter of fact, the real estate commission has a handy little rule that says sales contracts cannot state payments of commissions between brokers. And the reason is. The broker and the firm are not a party to the contract. The contract is between the buyer and the seller, the landlord and the tenant, not the real estate firm, not the broker. Does that make sense? That's why you have agency contracts. That's why it's required that you have a written agency contract to get paid in this business. That's a really important rule you ought to remember. You can't get paid unless you have an agency contract in writing. I don't care who you're representing, the buyer or the seller, You've got to have an agency contract in writing to get paid in this business. Okay? Good so far? You ought to be having to start the chat here. Okay. Examples of agency contracts, and, and Diane already said, listing agreement. Uh, it says here a listing agreement is an employment contract. Who's being employed? The broker. The broker. The firm. The seller is employing the firm <laughs> to sell their property for them. So if they're employing the firm, who does the listing belong to, the broker or the firm? The firm. The firm. If the broker leaves the firm, who does the listing belong to? The firm. If the broker wants to take it with them, can they have it? No. No. Because who does it belong to? The firm. The firm. By the same token, who else has agreed to this contract other than the firm? The, 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 client. the client, which in this case is the listing agreement, is who? The seller. Can the seller just go, 
I don't like you. I'm firing you. Yeah. No, no. If they could, then what would be the point of having a contract, folks? No. This is a contract. A bilateral contract. How many parties are bound to a bilateral contract? Yeah. Two. So, how can they fire one another if they want? Mutual agreement. They both agree that we don't want to be part of this anymore. The seller doesn't get to decide, I don't, I'm sick of my listing firm and firing them. And the listing firm doesn't get to decide, I'm sick of dealing with this seller. I'm firing them. Mutual agreement if they want to be rid of each other. Or expiration. That's the first rule of an agency contract in North Carolina. It always must what? Expire. Expire. It must have an end date. Now, we say with listing agreements, they must be in writing from their inception. From the very beginning, a listing agreement must be in writing. We didn't say agency contracts had to be in writing from their inception. We said specifically listing agreements have to be in writing. So what does that tell you about buyer agency agreements? They can start out not in writing, right? Mm -hmm. But I said, if you want to get paid, you've got to have what? Mm -hmm. A written agency agreement. So can buyer agency agreements stay no. oral? No. No. Okay, good. You think it. Good. Make sure you're awake. It's late. Listing agreements. Can they start oral? No. 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 They have to be in writing from the very beginning. You cannot put a sign in front of a house unless you have a written listing agreement. Simple as that. You cannot put in the MLS for sale. You cannot post a flyer. You can't do anything to market that property until you have a written listing agreement giving you permission to do that. Okay? The compensation has to be specified here. Whatever the firm is going to be paid, this is where it's going to be specified because where can you not put it? In the, sales in the sales contract. So this is the only other place to put it. It must be here. It's going to set out what the firm has to do in order to earn that commission. And we're going to talk about several different types of listing agreements and what the firm has to do in order to earn that commission. Okay? Now, we do need to talk about soliciting customers and things you can and cannot do. This seems silly, but they do like to throw it in on the test, on the national licensing exam in particular. Okay? There are laws that govern soliciting customers. How many of you have ever called, heard of the National Do Not Call Registry? Mm -hmm. Don't violate it. Do not violate it. If you're going to call someone, there's only two ways you can do that. If they have given you permission to call, number one. And how would they give you permission to call? Call my sign, so please call me back. Send me an email. I'm interested in this home. Please give me a call at such and such a number. Can you give them a call even if they're on the do not call registry at that point? Yeah. Do you even need to check to see if they're on the do not call registry at that point? No, because they have asked you to give them a call. If you're going to call someone who has not asked you to do that, do you have to check the National Do Not Call Registry? Yeah. You absolutely must check the National Do Not Call Registry. If you do not, you're going to be subject to many penalties and fines. Okay? okay. So if um, they say you can't call them, you only call them that one time? Generally, no. Because now you've established a relationship with them. Unless they tell you that's all they need from you, don't call me anymore, then you have to stop. Okay? But once you've established a brokerage relationship with them, you generally have a time period. And it's actually in your book. Um, the Do Not Call legislation gives you up to 18 months for someone you have an established business relationship with. So in essence, that permission to call is good for 18 months. So if you did a transaction with somebody you closed on their house, can you call them to solicit for business? Yes. For how long? 18 months. 18 months. After 18 months, do you have permission any longer? No. No, so you'd have to check to see if they were where? No. On the do not call registry. What if they called you, um, was interested, 
never really signed a contract, never really did anything. Still have That's a business relationship. Okay. Unless they tell you what? Don't call, don't call me anymore. Okay. At that point in time, they've clearly taken back their permission and you should not call. Okay? Don't call out of the blue. Don't pick up, I don't think anybody does this anymore, but don't pick up the phone book and just start dialing numbers. Okay? Don't do that. Yeah, what is a phone book, right? And you don't let your uh, fingers do the walking anymore, do you? I guess you do on Google, but that's about it. Okay? So make sure you check in the federal do not call registry. Okay? Um, it says telemarketers are now required to search the registry at least every, once every 31 days and drop registered numbers. Um, it does tell you what the penalties are. I don't think you'd be tested on that, but just for your reference, look at the next to the last paragraph on page 180. The federal level penalty is $11,000 per call. So don't do it. It's Who not money? How are they able to call you? I'm sorry? How are they able to call you? Are you on the do not call registry? Yeah. Then you can report them. If you can get the information, report them. Okay? With, you, with my luck, I would be the one that they would catch. So I'm not calling them. Unless I clearly have permission. I try not to call anybody, honestly, period, at all. Try to email. <clears throat> Don't call me if you want to get in touch with me. Email me. I hate the telephone. Because I'm on it all the time. You know, and so I just try to stay off of it as much. Some things are better conveyed through telephone conversation. But many things can be handled with email a lot more efficiently. Plus, I have a record of it if I do an email. If I talk about it on the phone, I'm like, yeah. And that's my big fear. I do it with email, I at least have a reminder. I've got it right there right in front of me. Yeah. The junk facts, don't worry about. You know what I mean? If you're faxing something, just shoot yourself anyway. But don't be faxing. I mean, you know, just don't. I mean, holy moly, guys. That's 40 year old. Out, it was outdated 20 years ago, right? I mean, that's, don't, don't do it. Scan it. Everybody's got a scanner in their pocket right now. You can download an app on your phone, right? Where you can turn any picture into a PDF. There's no reason to fax anything anymore. Especially to solicit somebody. If you're faxing somebody, it better be specifically because they said, I can only accept the fax. It's the only way you can get in touch with me. What's this app called? Um, there's one called uh, uh, PDF Lite, I think. Um, there's another called uh, Scan Wizard, something like that. Um, but just do an app search for, you know, picture yeah. PDF converter, mm -hmm. you know, or picture scanner, cool. and, and you'll find it. And you just take, I got the one I have, you can take a picture of a page, and it'll ask you, is this the whole document, or do you need to add another page? And I hit add page, and I take a picture of the next page, and so I can just do whatever number of pages I need to do, and it'll convert it to a PDF right there. Even better than that is never having this paper to start with. Do it as a digital transaction or can sign digitally. So there's never any paper. Lovely. I just sent an offer on the break. No paper. Tell me what you want on it. I write it up. I'll docu-sign it to you. Sign it like that. Just click the boxes and put your name in there. I promise. Okay. Um, the other one you have to worry about is the CAN spam app. This deals with email. Okay, basically any unsolicited email has to have the ability to unsubscribe, okay? There's not really a penalty for emailing someone in an unsolicited manner, but they do have to have the ability to unsubscribe from that list, okay? So there has to be a link on the email that says click here to unsubscribe, and then if they do, you can't email them anymore, okay? That's the can spam it. So which things are regulated? Which forms of communication are regulated? This is not a test question. Right? Telephone. Telephone. Telephone's regulated. Uh, Emails regulated. Fax. Fax is regulated. What form of communication mail. is not regulated? For mail. The U.S. mail. Folks, you can spam it all you want to through the post office. It just so happens that the federal government owns the post office and they would love your patronage. So <laughs> they likely will never create a law that says you cannot solicit through the mail. But you are free to send all the mail you want to your heart's content. Okay? So, 
When are we entitled to a commission? When we produce a ready, willing, and able buyer on terms that are agreeable to the seller. That's when we are generally entitled to a commission. Now, entitled and get are two different times and two different things, right? Entitled means contractually they owe it to us, right? Get means it's in my pocket. When are we entitled to a commission in a normal sales transaction? When are we entitled? When will you fulfill the... Uh, when do we find a ready, willing, and able buyer, folks? When this buyer, when you have somebody in a sales contract. When you put it under contract. If we put it under contract, have we not located a ready, willing, and able buyer at terms acceptable to the seller? Yes. Then they're not ready. She said, what if they can't get along? Then they're not ready. Right. So assuming we put a buyer under contract who is ready, willing, and able at terms acceptable to the seller, have we earned, are we entitled to that commission? Yes. Yes. <laughs> When do we generally collect these commissions that we're entitled to? At closing or after, right? So that leaves a gap of time here between when we're entitled to a commission and when we actually get this commission. What would we have to do if we got to the point of entitlement but we didn't get to the point where we normally get the commission if we wanted to collect it? We'd have to sue who? The person we had the agreement with. So if we were the listing firm, who would we have the agreement with? The seller. If we were the buyer agency, buyer firm, who would we have the agreement with? The buyer. That's who we would sue. Now, just because you're entitled to it, does that mean it's a good business decision to run around suing your clients who do not close? No. Probably not. So entitled, very different than getting. Okay? Everybody all right on that? Okay. Um, compensation should be disclosed in a timely manner in writing to everybody involved in the transaction. Who's the commission usually going to be paid by in a sales transaction? The seller. The seller. Now, usually, this commission is going to be split between the listing side and the other side. What do we call that other side? The buyer side. The buyer side. But there's another word I'm going to give you and you're going to hate it. And I'm sorry. I can't help that you hate it. I didn't come up with it. But you're going to have to know it. The listing side is indeed the seller side of the transaction. There's another word for the buyer side of the transaction. Can everybody see that? No. Selling side. Selling side of the transaction. Who does the selling firm represent? The selling firm, believe it or not, and I didn't make it up, I promise. Let me write it so Leslie can see it. It's in 3D now, Leslie. Can you see it? <laughs> it's just the green. You see it now? The selling side represents who? The listing side represents who? The seller. The seller. You need to learn that terminology. You will see that on exams. They use it purposefully because they know it will throw you off. The selling firm represents the buyer in the transaction. Why? Why? Yeah. So here's the only logic I've ever been able to come up with other than it just being silly. Yeah. Who's actually selling the property? Is it the, the listing agent who puts it out there and says this is for sale? Or is it the person who takes a buyer physically to the property, shows it to them, 
takes the time to write up an offer and presents an offer. Who's doing all the work selling it? The buyer side. The buyer side. The buyer side is doing all the work. Okay. Okay. So I write buyer agent. The listing firm's work is done when they put it out there for sale for the most part, right? Mm -hmm. Now they've got work to do once it goes under contract, helping evaluate the offer and all that. But the work of marketing the property is done before it's ever on the market. That's the listing side. Now it's time to sell it. Who's going to sell it? The, the, the seller's representatives or a buyer's representative? Buyer's, buyer's representative. I've said it better that way. I mean, it's the only thing I've ever been able to come up with. Okay? So the selling agent is working with the buyer. Well, if the selling firm and the listing firm are the same thing, what are we in? Dual, dual agency. That's dual agency when the selling firm and the listing firm are the same thing. That's dual agency. And by the way, that dual agency thing, they may throw it to you in weird ways. They may say, Jesse is a broker affiliate of the listing firm who's representing a buyer forward in the transaction. What is she? She's a dual agent. Because she's a broker affiliate of what? Of the listing firm, which represents what? Who's the listing firm represent? The seller. The seller. So if she's a broker affiliate of the listing firm, doesn't she represent the seller too? Yeah. And it says she's representing Ford in the transaction. So if he's the buyer, does she also represent the buyer? What do we call it when one firm represents the buyer and the seller at the same time, the same transaction? Dual agency. They won't say it's dual agency, but they'll say it in a convoluted way like that. Jesse is a broker affiliate of the listing firm ABC Realty. Jesse is working with and representing forward of the buyer agent on the transaction. What they just told you was she's a what? Dual agent. Jesse is a broker affiliate of the listing firm who's been working with a buyer forward, though she has no representation agreement with him. What is she? She's a seller sub agent. That's why I get tripped up all the time. I'm going to draw something like that. You know what? She's draw a picture. Draw a picture? You need to. When you get to these agency relationship question folks, you write down on a piece of paper. Buyer. So, and you read through that question, and it says, Jesse is a broker affiliate of the listing firm. Stop! On the seller side of the chart, what do you write? Jesse. Because she's on the seller side of the transaction. And then you keep reading. She's working with Ford as a buyer representative. On the buyer side, what do you also write? Jesse. Jesse. And now you look at your chart and you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> She's on both sides. What is she? You see how I'm making the chart like that would help? Right? If you read through that thing and she says, Jesse is a broker filling in the listing firm. She's working with buyer four, though she has no agency agreement with him. Which column is she going to be in? And only the seller side, right? So who does she represent? So the seller, that's going to be really important to do that. Okay? Is everybody good on that terminology? Listing firm represents the seller, selling firm represents the buyer. Okay? When we are negotiating these commissions, they are always negotiable. There are some federal laws here that come into play when we are talking about commissions. They're on page 183 in your textbook. Federal antitrust laws basically say you can't have set commissions. You can't have normal commissions. You can't have the going rate is this. You can't say, well, most firms charge this, but I won't charge you this. That's all a violation of federal laws against monopolies and price fixing. <laughs> Okay, because if you say the normal rate is six percent, what does that make it sound like is out there? Everybody charges six percent, right? How the hell do you know what everybody charges? Either you don't know what they charge and you're lying that that's the normal rate, right? Or 
you do know what they charge because what? You all got together and decided you'd charge the same thing. Either one of those is bad. So you don't say things like that. What do you say? Somebody asks you, what, how much you going to charge? What do you say? I charge. My firm charges. We charge. Those are acceptable ways to answer that question. Well, if your client says, everybody charges 6%, you say, I'm not aware of what everybody charges, but what we charge is 6%. <laughs> Five point nine nine percent. Listen, we all know that when you get out there, there are going to be lots of similarities when it comes to what firms charge. You just have to be very careful with the language you use about that. And you need to know that it needs to be negotiable on an individual basis. There's no such thing as a set commission. Okay? Even if you say, my firm only takes six percent listens, that's fine. But that is not a set commission. That just means you're not willing to represent anybody who won't agree to what? A 6% commission. But they are free to go somewhere else and negotiate their own commission. So commissions are always negotiable on a case-by-case -case basis. All right? That's always the best answer if you see it on the tip. Negotiable on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay? All right. Types of listing agreements. We're going to go over these and then I'm going to uh, teach you the basics of commission split math. Uh, those are the last two things I want to hit tonight. Okay? Um, and we're not going to do any commission split math, but I'm going to teach you the basics of it so tomorrow night when we do a lot of it, you come in here and you hit the ground running, you've got no problems with it. Okay? I promise you, that's one of those things that I teach better than anybody else. That you can be assured of. I ain't found nobody who says any different when they've seen it somewhere else and they come to me and they're like, I don't everybody do it that way. And I say, I don't know, they should. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm a little bit arrogant sometimes. But that one is one of them. You will not miss those questions. Okay? Times of listing agreements. Okay? The open listing. If I'm in an open relationship, how many people am I dating? Everyone. As many as I want. Right? An open listing is the same thing. If it's a listing, who are we, who are we working with? A seller, right? This is an agreement with a seller. How many firms is that seller limited to work with? As many as they want to. An open listing, a seller can work with as many firms as they want to. Can they hire can they hire ten firms to represent them, sell that property, and have ten different signs in front of their house? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the real question about these different listings is sorry, let me When is the firm owed a commission? Now, we said previously when we produce a ready, willing, and able buyer on terms agreeable to the seller, right? The question is the source of that buyer. That's what the difference between these types of listing agreements is. Where the buyer comes from. Because in some of these, it's going to be a very limited place the buyer can come from where we get paid, where the listing firm gets paid. In one of these, it's going to be from anywhere. Okay? That's the difference. When is the listing firm owed a commission? You will see this on the test. Which is funny, because in the real world, you ain't going to never see anything but that one right there in the middle, that exclusive right to sell list. I promise. You go try to fill out one of these things right here, you will get fired from your firm in a heartbeat. As a matter of fact, I don't even think the form exists. I've never seen one. But we have to teach it to you, okay? And you will get tested on it. So this open listing, how many people, how many firms can the seller hire? As many as, as many as they want to. Well, here's the thing, folks. When I'm hiring more than one firm, I'm not going to say to them, anybody buys my house, I'll pay you a commission. I'm going to say to them, if you sell my house, I'll pay you a commission. 
In other words, if your firm brings me a buyer. So what's the only two ways that we could get paid if we are in an open listing? Go back to the ways we can work with buyer clients. As a buyer client, we can be an exclusive agent, right? Right? Mm -hmm. We can be a true dual agent, a designated dual agent, right? Or we can be a seller sub agent. Are those the four ways we can work with a buyer? Right? Which ones of those would work for us getting paid in an open listing? Can we be an exclusive buyer agent and get paid? No. No. Because we're already the listing firm, right? right. Yeah. There's no way for us to be the exclusive buyer agent. Well, what if some other firm comes in as their exclusive buyer agent? Would we get paid? No. No, because we didn't produce that buyer. Who would get paid? That other firm that did produce the buyer. Does that make sense? Yep. So in an open listing, when is the only time our firm gets paid? When we produce the buyer. Yep. So, in essence, we would have to be a dual agent, right? Because we produce the buyer in a dual agency situation. A designated dual agent or a seller sub agent. It's the only way we could get paid in an open listing. Does that make sense? This is sort of like somebody saying to you, my property's for sale, yeah, but if you bring me a buyer, I'll pay you this much money. My property's for sale, but if you bring me a buyer, I'll pay you, I'll pay you money. No, it's unilateral. Right? That's an open listing. Here's the big rule about it, though. What is the first word of the next two that you see here? So guess what an oral is? I mean, an open is not exclusive. An open listing is not exclusive. It means you can have how many firms? As many as you want. It also means you can't tie that seller down to you if you have an open listing. Has everybody got that? So now let's talk about the next one, the exclusive agency listing. We've inserted that word exclusive. How many real estate firms are involved now? One and only one. In this one, the real estate firm is going to get paid no matter where the buyer comes from except under one circumstance. There's one circumstance where the listing firm would not get paid a commission if the seller sells it themselves. If the seller sells it themselves, they don't have to pay a commission. Now you hear that and you think, well, that sounds like the fairest thing in the world. I don't know why they're all not like that. Right? I mean, if the seller sells it themselves, they don't, I mean, why would they pay us? We didn't do anything. And so here's how that works in the real world. Who's going to go over there and measure the house and take pictures of it, and print flyers of it? The listing firm is, right? Who's, who pays MLS dues so they can put it in the MLS? The listing firm does. Who um, has an internet website dedicated to showcasing properties? The listing firm does. Who's going to make sure it gets to Truly and Zillow and Oodle and eBay Homes and all those other 4,000 websites that deal with real estate? The listing firm. Who's going to put a sign in front of it? Listen from who's gonna put fly boxes out front? Listen from where is the buyer gonna find out about this thing? From, the from some marketing that who did the, the listing firm. And here's what's gonna happen: they're gonna drive by, and they're gonna go take one of your. They're gonna see your sign. That's how they know it's the right house. They're gonna take your fly out of that flyer box because they want the information. They're gonna go to your website. And look at all the pictures, and the seller's going to be out there playing flowers in the front yard and go have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. And say to them, look, you won't come in there and look at it because if, if I sell it to you, if you're interested, you may as well let me sell it to you because I don't have to pay a commission. I can give you a better deal than if you go through the real estate firm. Will happen every single time. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're not going to ever do one of these things. Okay? You will never do one of these things in the real world. 
Because all it means is you're going to be competing against your own client. And that's not a good deal. So, this one is the one you're going to do, the exclusive right to sell listing. When, do, when does the, the listing firm earn a commission in this case? When it's sold. sold. When it's yeah. sold. Where, where does the buyer have to come from? Yeah. Anywhere. What if it's the seller's mom who buys the property? It does not matter. The listing firm has still earned a commission in that case. You see why this is the one you're going to do in the real world? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, for you, for test taking purposes, make sure you understand that in an open listing, the listing firm only gets paid when they do what? Bring a when they bring a buyer. If another real estate firm produces a buyer, do they get paid? Yes. yes. Does the listing firm get paid if no. another real estate firm produces a buyer? No. no. In an exclusive agency listing, when does the listing firm get paid? When the listing firm brings a buyer? How about when another real estate firm brings a buyer? Yes, still. The listing firm still gets paid. What's the only case? Any real estate firm produces a buyer, they get paid, right? Mm -hmm. What's the only case where they wouldn't get paid? The seller brings the, the, seller buyer. Brings the buyer. In the exclusive right to sell listing, when does the listing firm get paid? When the buyer comes from where? Anywhere. It doesn't matter. Remember that one. Exclusive right to sell. It's hard to remember because you got exclusive agency and exclusive right to sell, right? So exclusive right to sell is the big one. That's the one you want. That's the one where the listing firm is owed a commission no matter where the buyer comes from. Okay, we also have something called a protection agreement. In your notes by protection agreement, I want you to put FISBO, F-S-B-O. FISBO, F-S-B-O. Four worst letters in the history of the world. For sale by owner. Why is it the worst four letters in the history of the world? Because I ain't getting paid. That's why. But there is the potential for you to get paid for being involved in a for sale by owner transaction. Clearly, the seller does not have representation, right? The but buyer. who might have representation? The buyer. The buyer. Now, who's going to be paying the commission most likely? The seller. The seller. Normally, sellers agree to pay commissions where? In their listing agreement. What do they not have in this case? They don't have a listing agreement. So nowhere on paper have they agreed to pay anybody anything, right? Right. So if you're a buyer agent and your buyer wants to see a FISBO, a for sale by owner property, don't you think it would be a good idea for you to get some agreement in writing that if your buyer purchases this property, they will pay you a commission for it? That's what a protection agreement is. <coughs> It's an agreement to compensate a selling firm, a buyer's firm, on a for sale by owner situation. When should you get this agreement? Before you show or after you make an offer? Before you show. You wait till they make an offer and be like, I'm sorry, I'm paying nothing. Because you weren't afraid. Can you refuse to transmit an offer if you if, if the seller won't sign that protection agreement? Can you refuse to show that property to your buyer if the seller won't pay you a commission? What yes and no? No and no. <laughs> no. You're not allowed to refuse to show somebody something. You signed an agreement to represent them. Now, you haven't gotten to buyer agency agreements yet, but what did I say a seller agrees to do on a listing agreement? Do what? Pay a commission. What do you think a buyer also agrees to do on a buyer agency agreement? Yeah. Pay a commission. What they what theirs says though is, if the seller won't pay you, we will. So, can you refuse to show your buyer that for sale by owner? No. no. So you better have what? A buyer agreement that says, if the seller won't pay me. You, Mr. Buyer, will. So that they understand, I can go look at that for sale by owner, but I don't have to pay a commission on top of that sales price, right? You better believe you tell them. You know what I say to them? I say, look, this is a for sale by owner. I contact the seller. They're not willing to pay a commission. 
your buyer agency agreement says that if they don't pay, you will pay this 2.5%, 3%, whatever we put in our buyer agency agreement. So, do you still want to see it? You know what the answer is going to be? Uh, no, thanks. But the key here is you can't refuse to show it, right? You can't refuse to participate in a transaction because the commission is too low or it's not being paid. That's why you have buyer agency agreements. You see why it's important to have a written buyer agency agreement? What if you've got an oral buyer agency agreement and the buyer wants to see a FISBA? Call working for free. Don't do it. Don't do it. Get it in writing, okay? Fee for services. The next one down here, some people call this a la carte real estate. What does a la carte mean? You go to a fancy restaurant, what does a la carte mean? Priced individually, right? Instead of your steak coming with a potato and a vegetable and, and bread, you got to order it all separate, right? That $42 is just for the steak. And then there's another $12 for the potato, right? That's the way it works at those places. That You can do real estate that way. Some firms do real estate that way. We call them limited services firms, entry-only firms. What are they entering? The listing. the listing where? The MLS, because that's what people want access to when they do this thing, right? They just want to get their house on the MLS because the MLS, they realize the MLS is the best exposure for their house. And the listing firm is essentially saying, we're not going to do anything for you but put it in the MLS. Can they do that? Yes. Here's your yes and no. Yes. yes and no. Yes, they can do that. No, they can't only do that. Because the Real Estate Commission says that there are certain duties that are non-negotiable no matter how much you do or don't charge. Like that disclosure of material facts thing we talked about last chapter, or two chapters ago. Those four categories of material facts that every listing agent has to disclose. So you st say that again. You still got to go physically check the house, right? If you put square footage out there, who's got to measure it? The listing agent does. Who's responsible for all those disclosures on the listing? The listing agent is. What the Real Estate Commission is saying here is we don't care what you charge. You charge whatever you want to. And there are certain services that are negotiable, but there are certain ones that are non-negotiable. And these ones that are required by law are non-negotiable. Got that? So like disclosure material facts, Helping them negotiate offers, providing advice, all those things are non-negotiable. Okay? We good on that? Now, I want to show you, before you go home tonight, the secret to doing commission split math. And we're going to do some math tomorrow night with this. But I call this the commission tree. And the reason I call this the commission tree is because it gives you a visual representation of how commissions are split in the real world. Okay? In the real world, the commission doesn't all go to the listing broker. We wish it did. When you tell somebody they charge 6%, the first thing that seller thinks is, God, I got to get paid. $20,000 to sell my house. Huh, I wish. That thing's going to get diced up so many different ways it don't even look like $20,000 anymore by the time we're done with it. That's what happens in the real world. And you have to know how those splits work. The problem is they're going to give you really long questions with really complicated verbiage to, to explain a simple math question. So you need something visually to sort through all the nonsense. Okay? And that's what this does. What does every transaction start with? A listing agreement. A listing agreement. <laughs> a listing agreement, we've got a total a price. A to, we got a list price, right? And we got a total commission, right? That's the first two things that a transaction starts with. So at the end of the day, what do we figure the commission based off of? The sales, sales price. Sales price. So we start at the top of the tree with a sales price. Okay? And based on that sales price, we charge 
a listing total commission now first thing we do in most transactions is split that commission we split that commission between two firms which two firms are they? Seller. 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 Firm representing who? Seller. The seller, and we call them the what? Listing. Listing. listing firm. So this is the listing side. And selling side. Selling side. The selling side. Yes. They're hanging up. First split is between the listing side and the selling side. How much of the commission do they share between them? 50-50. Is it 50-50? Uh, How much do they share between them total? 100%. Oh, 100%, right? Whatever these splits are, they have to add up to 100%. Here's why that's important. In the question, it's going to tell you the listing side cooperates with selling firms by offering them 40% of the total commission. In that case, where does the 40% go? The this side or this side? The selling side. The selling side, right? Well, if this happened to be 40%, what does this one have to be? And that's exactly how you're going to do this thing. Every time you get one piece of information, you're going to fill in the other side. Because guess what? At the end of the question, you don't know which way you're going to be going. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So as you go, you're going to fill this in. All right? And it could be 35-65. It could be 50-50. But you're going to fill it in as you go. Always remember, it has to add up to 100%. Are we done splitting this thing? No. No, no why not? Because that goes to the, the, the agent. We haven't gotten any brokers yet, right? Mm -hmm. This is what gets paid to each firm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They gotta pay somebody in, right? Mm -hmm. They gotta pay the brokers. So we're gonna split each side up. What percent of each side is getting split? hundred percent. So these splits also have to add up to hundred percent. Who are we splitting between on the listing side? The listing firm and who? How about on this side? Why did I write selling up here and power down here? Just to show you the same thing. Exactly. Just to show you they're used and interchangeable. The buyer's firm is the selling firm. The buyer's broker is the selling broker. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, here is, and it's not magic, but here's the magic of the thing. If they give you the sales price and they ask you for somebody's commission, you're going from the top of the tree to the bottom of the tree. Correct? Mm -hmm. And when you go from the top of the tree to the bottom of the tree in this direction, you multiply. When they give you a commission and they ask you for a sales price, commissions come out where? Right. On the bottom. Where's the sales price? Right. So if they give you a commission and ask you for a sales price, you're going from the bottom to the top. What do you think you're going to do? Divide. You're going to divide. So now let me read. I'm just going to make one up off the top of my head and we're going to fill it in as we go. Don't worry about writing it down. I just want to show you how you would use this thing. Travis is a listing broker with Pan Realty. 
He lists Jermaine's property on 123 Main Street. Well, I probably need to stop right there. Because they've already given me some information. Right? What information have they given me? They've given me where Travis is on the chart. Right? Where is he? He's on the listing side. Right? What do you see? He is the listing broker, right? Fill it in. That's what you do. You fill it in as you read it. He's a listing broker with whom? Pan Realty. So they are the listing firm, right? Pan. He lists the property at 123 Main Street for Jermaine for a total list uh, commission of 7%. Where did I put that? Total commission line, 7%. Pan has a company policy of, co of uh, cooperating with buyer-side firms by keeping 40% of the total commission for themselves. They have an agreement. They have a policy of cooperating with buyer-side firms by keeping 40% of the total commission themselves. Who's keeping the 40%? The listing side is, right? Mm -hmm. So the 40% goes over here, which means this must be what? 60%. Travis has an agreement with Pan Realty whereby he keeps 75% of all his transactions. Where does that go? Listing broker. broker Travis, right? It goes with Travis. So if this is 75%, what must this one be? 25%. Pan Realty's brokerage share of the closing was $2,385. What was the total sales price? Where does the $2,385 go? Pan Realty. Pan Realty. $2,385. Which way are we going? Bottom to top or top to bottom? Bottom to top. Bottom to top. What number do we start with? 2385. What are we doing? Divided. Divided. 2385 divided by what's the first split we get to? 25%. Right? Mm -hmm. If we're working our way up, we go up until we find another split, right? What's the next split we get to? 20%. Divided by, you don't even take it out of your calculator. 2385 divided by 25%. Divided by 40%. Divided by 7%. And it will give you the sales price, folks. What is that sales price? Three hundred forty thousand seven hundred fourteen. Three hundred forty grand. Does everybody see how that works? Mm -hmm. Okay. Tomorrow night we will work on those. All right. See you tomorrow.